Hello! How is everyone doing? Um, happy Sunday. Happy Palm Easter. Um, we are pretty much wrapping up the Lent season and getting into the Easter liturgical season soon. So hopefully you're doing well there. Double check the, uh, we're going to double check audio first before we get into the camera. And um, yeah, that was a, what was that? Primitive supposition. Uh, my track there, if you want to check it out at sandengraver.com. Uh, I need to actually put up more music. I have a few selections, but I, I need a lot more. Uh, let me take this banner off. I don't know if you're too close to the microphone, but when you first came on, it was a little super hot, like the game was up or something. Echoey? Yeah. Oh. Not echoey, just like the game yeah. was up too much. But it sounded good after you started clearing out your... Well, just in case I get excited. Sorry, this is live with my husband. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn the game down just a little bit. Thank you. Oops. All right, I'm going to bring the game down just a little bit. Uh, so hopefully that looks, or rather that sounds okay. Um, I'm kind of close to my mic. I might have it back off just a little bit. There we go. I think I need not a new mic stand, but a new piece that attaches the mic to the stand. All right, so let us check that for audio then i'll get into the comments okay so now it sounds good by my wonderful professor great wonderful because we have that now and man it sounds like i haven't been speaking all day which is probably true uh there we got the camera there so uh okay i look up at the camera that's right i'm still not used to this format uh hopefully everything is going well uh let's see just adjusting yeah, the settings just a little bit. Good. All right, so happy Sunday. Uh, this will be a fun topic, I think, because I like talking about this kind of stuff. And you guys usually have some very good feedback on, you know, art discussions. I like talking about art. I like to talk about things like misconceptions and talking about art stuff that people either don't know about or refuse to believe. So anyway, uh, let's get into the chat just to see how you guys are doing and who's in here. I think first was Ghost Team, Ghost Planet, Max Inc. 1.0. Oh, I say Ghost Team is Ghost Planet, Max Inc. 1.0. And of course, my wonderful prof who says the Captain Mal Reynolds School Art, which uh, the quote was, let me see if I remember. I aim to misbehave, which it's a series I haven't seen yet, so I should see it and and before I can imitate it that well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the the you aim to misbehave, and that's we'll we'll touch on that as far as the the view of bad art and why some people don't believe bad art exists and why I will say otherwise. We've also got Private Eye. It's good to have you. Brian Gilmartin, always a pleasure to have you, especially when we talk about things like art. You say, why would people, why would, if I can, I shouldn't read so fast. Why would people intentionally make bad art? Laziness comes to mind. It's actually, it can be, but it's, it's more intentional than that. Uh, Ace is in the house. Welcome. Uh, you say the, the thumbnail text is the outlook of the majority of the generation zero in the workforce. Yeah, I kind of meant the text to be kind of rough around the edges, kind of spotty, kind of granular. It was the best font I could think of for, for the topic. Good. Music is coming or was coming in nice and clear. We've got coffee with us. Welcome. Samuel Proctor. Good to see you. Thank you for coming along <laughs> to that arpeggiated instrument. All right. New comments, new comments. Big Al presents. Hope you have a good stream. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to see you. We've got Adega Outlaw. Good to see you too. Uh, writer Adega Outlaw. Go check out his work if you like dark fantasy and sci-fi. And uh, Dread Pirate Roma Romando. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> I think I've seen you before, like once or so. Uh, and Andreas, a regular. Uh, how was your birthday, Sound Engraver? Good. Yeah. Well, it was last week, last weekend. And uh, it was it was nice. I got um, some nice, nice gifts, uh, practical, but also cool. Uh, one of my gifts, actually. So, you know, around the community, uh, you know, Professor Geek has talked about it. He's he's seen other commentators talk about it, physical media. And I, I sort of um, I don't have it with me. It's, it's in the other room. But I, I sort of, you know, I grew up 
in the 90s, getting into the early aughts. And it was reruns at the time. It wasn't uh, airing, obviously. But I, I grew I did grow up with something like The Cosby Show. And it's just something that, you know, people or at least stores wouldn't sell. So I was always wistful thinking, man, I kind of wish I had, uh, you know, physical DVDs of The Cosby Show. And, um, and sure enough, my prof brought, bought me the complete, I think it was 10 seasons of the Cosby show. And so I'm, I'm glad to have that in, in the physical hand. And, you know, just, you know, just in case, I know there was this whole big old public scandal almost 10 years ago with Bill Cosby. And uh, because of his name and reputation being tarnished by public opinion, um, whether true or not, it's, it'd be hard to, you know, uh, attain some of that, some of that stuff. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not, if, if what was said about him is true or if he has a big ego, whatever, there's nothing I condone about what he, what he's done. Um, but at least in the seventies and eighties, he definitely tried to push. He, he, he was a staunch advocate of literacy in the urban schools and urban uh, environments. So, you know, I'll, I'll give him credit for that. <laughs> so anyway, I got that. It's, it's important to have like physical DVDs cause you know, it's just, important to have. Anyway, so that was, and then I got, I got a couple pairs of house slippers. I know that's exciting, right? It is to me. So I had a great birthday. Um, I had tortilla soup, which lasted for three days, which tasted delicious every day. It was so good. All right. But we're going to talk about art and, um, nine breaker. Good to see you. Uh, a says, I enjoy the rough edges around. I, I enjoy Rough around the edges with mu music, the lo-fi sound gives a raw punch in the face. Lo-fi is really popular with that, with that kind of idea, that kind of sentiment for sure. I'm more of a, a warm, sweet, upbeat, ambient type. I, I like my sound not too big, not too small, just right. <laughs> uh, anyway, so let's talk about art. So we, I think we welcomed everyone in the chat. Forgive me if I haven't welcomed you or... Uh, if you maybe you're just listening in, but yeah, art is important to talk about, and uh, you know, especially in the context of our culture, whether culture today or what it's been in the past or what it will be in the future. Uh, art is imperative. Art is very important to talk about, and it's especially the the sentiments and misconceptions behind what art it really is. Now, for this video, we're going to be talking about why people think. Well, let's say. Uh, okay, basically, the topic is why bad art exists. And thus, it will we'll be talking about why some people might not believe bad art exists. But, it, you know, whatever happens. So this isn't really off the cuff this time. I, I do have, if you could see, whoa, there's my, my notes, my bullet points. Um, I'm going to go through these bullet points as fast as I can or, you know, as, as fast as I need to. And probably... Um, maybe not extemporized, but just go into detail with each bullet point. And if you guys have any of your own personal reasons why bad art exists, just let me know. So let me grab some water. So I'll go through these, then we can just talk amongst ourselves, or you can talk amongst yourselves, and I can uh, see what's going on. Oh, and actually, uh, before I do, uh, Nathaniel, I did forget to uh, uh, greet you. Sorry about that. Uh, you do say, on a more sinister level, uh, people want to destroy destroy the art form itself. Yes, yes, that that was a that was a common occurrence in the 20th century. Uh, you know, I, I do. I'm glad for being born in the 20th century, but I'm I'm kind of glad we're not in the 20th century anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that happened, and a lot of negative stuff at that. Okay, so so I'll just go. Uh, with this little lecture, and then we'll get into our comments. So why bad art exists? And there are several reasons. I'm going to go through each one of these. Uh, the first is there's a belief that creativity or the act of creating is good. Now, this is true. But while this is true, some argue that's good enough to be art. So, yes, to make art, to produce art, and to procure art in any way, whether you preserve art yourself or you make art yourself or you do, do both. Yes, you are to some extent a creative person. 
you are a creative person if you are in the act of creating. And that is good. Creativity is good. Imagination is good. Imagination is what separates us from the animal, the rest of the animal kingdom, right? <laughs> Being a little cheeky when I say that, but imagination is indicative of your own unique personhood and also all of humanity. So creativity is good, but a lot of people believe that because art is a creative endeavor, no art can be bad. But that's not true because even if even if you are creative, you have to work at your craft over time, over um, discipline, uh, using disciplinary actions, uh, maybe some you know, self-regulation or a, a, a regimental routine to get better. Maybe you go through, you know, a, you know, some courses, maybe you go to art school. You do need to get better, even though you are maybe inherently creative, or maybe you, you even work to be becoming creative just on its own. That is good, but it's not good enough to be art. Art is separate. It's not separate from being creative, but there's an add-on to that. And that add-on is a level of talent, but also skill. Skill is more important. Talent is also important, but skill is the thing that separates just spontaneous creativity, you know, like, like that of someone young in their endeavor to someone who's been a professional, even if they don't make money. You know, someone can professionally produce some music, you know, on a professional level, even if they don't make money. Just when I say profession, I mean the act of creating something of high quality. So there's this belief, as a recap, there's this belief that creativity on its own is is good enough, which I, I agree. Where I don't agree is that people think, well, art is a creative endeavor, therefore all art is good. There's no art that is bad. And that is simply not true. Art must be good. And so there is a distinction between good art and bad art out there, even if people don't want to recognize that for that reason that I just talked about. The second reason, this, the second reason why bad art exists is that there is this social need to push and blur boundaries. Now, that on its own is actually really, I would say, a good thing because it enables you to explore different things, explore different styles, methods, uh, pedagogies, different ways of producing a thing that is unique to you. Because all illustrators do not approach an illustration with the same method. Uh, and some people really push the line, really push the boundaries, are more or less progressive about it. And I don't mean politically progressive, but they they want to see how much toward the periphery they can, they can go. I, I explored that a lot with the, for instance, the chamber music ensemble when I was in undergrad, also graduate studies. Like I remember composing a quartet. I actually called it peripheries because that, that was the piece's name, because I was trying to really go beyond the traditional sound of the string quartet. Now, that was a great experiment. And I had actually a professional string quartet from Chicago, out of Chicago, uh, play it and they played wonderfully. And, and I thought it was uh, people like my professors really liked it. Um, but it, it was enough to know, okay, I know what to do with the string instrument. Like I know all the capacity and, and the technique of a given string instrument. That was the point. But it was an exploration, an exploration. That, that's what it was. So I think pushing boundaries and blurring the boundaries for the sake of exploration and experimentation is very, very important. Where people get carried away, and this can be a social and political sentiment too, is they, uh, they, they think, well, that's the trajectory, that's the line, that's the direction I have to take. Because if I'm within the boundaries, there's something limiting to my art. Uh, I think it was Gene Wilder, I can't remember. You know, some, some artist said, that which defines limits. And people can take that too far. People can say, well, no, music should have no specific form or structure or sound. You know, sound can be music. That, that was a, a huge sentiment in college. 
Uh, so yes, on the one hand, it is important to expand the gamut. It's ex it's important as an artist to experiment and push boundaries and see how far you can go. But don't take it to an extreme level where the art is not recognized, where, where some people just don't know what to make of something. Some people like that, like some artists, you know, and, and like the art museums and like the modern art museums in New York and probably Chicago, Milwaukee, whatever. Uh, actually, Milwaukee Art Museum is really pretty. <laughs> it's, it's a good museum. Anyway, they're fine with with having their art un unrec unrecognizable. But they art has in a, in a way has limitations and that's okay. You know, because because our own understanding of art and comprehension has its threshold as well. And and I think that's important. So, that's the second reason the need to push and blur boundaries. Now, this ties in with the third reason. And this is, there's a little bit more, I would say, I would dare say malice behind this reason. And that is breaking this, this need to break convention, tradition, and standards. Again, if you didn't break convention, music of the 1500s would sound the same as music of the 1300s or music of the 1700s would sound like music of the 1500s. So there was a natural progression of Western classical music. There is a huge distinction between Monteverdi and then Vivaldi with different people like Corelli into Bach. Bach was a huge leap in terms of structure and instrumentation and, and harmony than, than people like Monteverdi or Michaud or something like that. So or someone like that, I should say. So breaking convention or, or, or going beyond the conventional art form in a given period has its place in art history, no denying that. But when people break convention because they scoff at convention, when they scoff at tradition, that's where there is a problem. Artists fall into this trap saying, well, all convention is bad. All convention, all tradition, all standards of excellence is a negative thing. Therefore, I need to do the opposite. I need to do the antithesis of that. And again, that has its place in art history. Go go to the 20th century, you know, the, all the art movements of the 20th century, music or visual, and, and you'll see a huge break, a breaking away of convention. But if you're if you go too far, you can't progress after that. Like you can't go anywhere after you say something like, well, all tradition, all standards of beauty is meaningless. So let's, let's be nonconformist, if you will. Well, you can only go so far before everything gets to be the same or boring, or dare I say conventional, like the idea of breaking convention. If you do that in the, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this right now. If you do that in the 21st century, you are being conventional about that. Some some of these academics in the universities, they don't understand it. They're like, I got to break convention. I got to break the traditional structure of melody and harmony. And it's like, that's, that's an, by now, that's like a 70 to 100 year old sentiment. So you're actually being conventional and you're needing to break convention. So that's the third thing. Why, why is there bad art out there? Well, there's this need to break convention and tradition and standards, not knowing how to execute that notion properly or aesthetically or impactfully. So that's the, that's the third thing. The fourth thing, the fourth reason why people may not believe bad art exists or why I do believe bad art exists. Um, people believe, or they, they have this belief that art is only an intrinsic experience, meaning it's just subject to you. It's just subject to how you perceive something. So if you like a bad piece of film, that makes that film okay. It, it had, like art should only have something to do with you. It, it doesn't, it, it can't be bad if you in some way have a positive experience with that piece of art. There's this social need among artists to be open-minded 
we, we got to be open minded. There's there's no bad art. It's just how you experience it. So when you make art exclusively about you, about the subject, so the subject viewing the art piece, well, then I guess that logic would would follow that. OK, there's no real bad piece of art because everyone is going to view that piece of art in a different way. Some positive some negative, but not universally negative. So therefore, it's a good piece of art, or it's just art. Art is neither good nor bad. It just is. So that's the fourth reason people actually believing there's no nothing extrinsic about art. And I'm, I'm the opposite. Like, art is about you. It's not about you. Like art can exist outside you which I think makes it wonderful because it, it points to a higher order of things, even if it's just on a humanitarian level. So that's the fourth reason why bad art exists is people have this notion for the sake of being open-minded. They have this notion that, uh, oh, well, no, 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 that, that I like it. Maybe you don't like that piece of art, but I like it. Therefore the experience is good. Therefore the art is good. It's like, no, your experience of the art piece is good, but the art piece is still bad. <laughs> And people get miffed at that because they they think that you invalid invalidate them for that that reason. So that's the fourth reason. All right, let's see what's my fifth reason. I might have to read this. Uh, let's see, I have the belief that quote the good is a construct and therefore a cultural in impedance. Let me say that again. The belief that quote the good unquote is a construct and therefore a cultural impedance. Furthermore, the good quote is a form of cultural imperialism and elitism. So I actually had heard this opinion from a, a video I was watching because again, I, I go on YouTube to, to understand what people think about this kind of stuff. You'd be surprised how there, there are so few videos out there on YouTube that really talk about an honest view of why art is not subjective. <laughs> it's hard to find. People really, artists especially, they want to be really open-minded about this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's very hard to find opinions like mine. And I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Like any any academic artistic opinion, it's like, no, this all art is good or all, all art is, you know. So anyway, um, but there, this one video, he, I think... I, I don't know the channel's name. I can't remember. I was watching it a couple of days ago and he started the video with the title too, is art objectively bad. And it was like 24 minutes where toward the end, toward like the 24 minutes is he was saying, well, no, art is not objectively bad. And, and one of the reasons I, one of the, you know, among the bullet points that I have, one of the sentiments he gave was, uh, well, if you put standards on art, and he was really being uh, quantitative about it, uh, very, very, very much like a, a criteria, like a, a, an assessment you would give a, a, an employee at a job, really. Uh, that's what it sounded like. But um, if you give the his his sentiment was if you give people this. Uh, um, the, or rather, if you give art these standards, like he scoffed at the word standards. Uh, standards of excellence, well, then that's a form of elitism. That's a form of cultural imperialism. Like you you put your, he didn't say it, but I, he was from, I think he was from England. Uh, he, he was saying, basically, you're putting, you're imposing your Western beliefs of standards of excellence upon all the world. And it's like, you are missing the point of art entirely because art, good art transcends all barriers all cultural barriers, all language barriers. It just does. Go go, pick a random country out there, look at a piece of architecture and be moved by it. You know, some, some Arab nation uh, that's predominantly Muslim, I can still be moved by their architecture. I can still be moved by their art pieces. Same, same with obviously places like Japan or South Korea, you know, it's like, I don't have to speak their language. I don't have to have their religion. I could be diametrically opposed to their way of life and still be moved. And I'm not saying I am, but just putting that in, in perspective, I could be very different from them culturally, philosophically, um, 
language wise, you know, I could be so different from them and still be impacted by a good piece of uh, sculpture, architecture, painting. So, so the, this notion of cultural imperialism is, is a far stretch, I would say, because uh, other nations with other languages have the same standards of excellence for, for their own different art forms. So it was a very strange belief that this, uh, this standard of good quality, the good, uh, is a, a cultural impedance. It was really strange to hear that. So, but I had to write that down. So anyway, that's halfway down the list. Let's keep going. So that was reason number five, I think. I, I, have, to, I have to double check. One, two, three, four. Oh, no, that's four. Okay. This is, this is reason number five. The belief that normal is regressive or negative. So we see that all over with, with mainstream entertainment. Uh, this, this just absolute antipathy toward what normal is. Like, like people hate normal. Like, so <laughs> having a domestic, uh, or, or how, how should I put this? Seeing, well, I hate to use this example, but it's the first example I, I have. The nuclear family. Like the, you know, the average, you know, husband and wife with two or three kids in America, that idea is a normal one. And for people to not like that being normal, they, what they, what, what do they want to do? They, they want to break down and tear down traditional family values and dynamics. Now we're talking about art, but the same sentiment is there. I, I promise you. And one example and this had nothing to do with me in the university. Again, go go on YouTube, see what, what these people have to say. And I think it was a TED Talk because I was trying to understand more the public's opinion of, of contemporary art, not, not an academic opinion. And so I was like, oh, a, te a TED Talk on contemporary art. And it, it was this lady who showed an image of this room, standard room in an apartment and... Uh, and it was messy. It was filthy. And it was, it was an illustration, actually. It wasn't even a real room. It wasn't photographed or anything. It was just an illustration of this filthy room. Uh, the bed wasn't made. There were dirty clothes strewn all about the floor. Even some parts of the floor had um, female hygienic products that were already used. Uh, maybe some spilled pills, medication pills. Uh, the, the whole color of the illustration was kind of this mute, if, if I remember correctly, it was this kind of muted brown and purple, it just wasn't pleasant at all. And the speaker who was supporting contemporary art and, and the notions behind it, uh, she was saying, well, does, what do you think of this room? Does this make you sick? Does it make you look uncomfortable or does it make you feel uncomfortable? Would you not want to be in a room like this? Well, that's the point of contemporary art is to make you feel uncomfortable and, and recognize your level of discomfort with a room like this. And it's like, well, what, what's the point of that? <laughs> to be honest, some people, not everyone, but some people, I would say most people prefer at least a room straightened out. Because most people in the domestic situation, like living in a house or an apartment, family or otherwise, most people take care of dirty clothes. I mean, unless they're really, really busy, most people want to take care of dirty clothes. They don't want, oh, I mean, I'm not, if, if they don't do anything about it, it's a matter of laziness. And maybe it's, uh, people understand that it's a matter of laziness. But most people, if you asked, or if you asked to be invited into their apartment and then and maybe they'll say no. It's like ah, it's it's too dirty. I've got I've got dirty clothes. Or or even if you go into an apartment and the friend says, ah, oh, sorry about the the dirty clothes or something like that. There's there's a normal sense of I got to take care of my dirty clothes. And the TED Talk speaker, she was trying to convince you, like, no, understand your le level of discomfort of what is not normal or what is not right, and accept it. And it's like no, people by and large like normal. And so that's the fifth belief that this, the, the, the sentiment is normal is bad. Normal is negative. It's regressive. 
we need to embrace the unconventional and make that normal. That That's kind of funny if you notice, like people hate the normal, but they try to make what's not normal, normal, you know, very interesting how that works. But anyway, that's the fifth reason, I believe. Reason number six, the belief that the idea alone is good enough. So even if you have a terrible piece of art, if the idea behind that art is right or interesting or intriguing, then that's a good work in, in and of itself. One example is having the artist and attendee have the same role. So the artist would maybe get a truckload of tires and then the art piece would be the artist climbing on the tires and then inviting all the attendees to climb on the tires with them. So it's an interesting idea, but it's like, is that art? I mean, the, the most amount of effort that you gave that art piece was calling a guy with a truckload of tires and say, hey, I need like 12 dozen tires here for people to climb on. <laughs> uh, but anyone could do that. Not just an artist, anyone could do that. So that's where, where people say, well, no, it's not a bad piece of art because the idea is interesting enough. The idea is intriguing. It's like, well, no, art needs to be well executed too. A lot of a lot of um, early, I would say late 1800s, artists coming from the late 1800s had very interesting ideas, philosophical, political, artistic ideas. But with those ideas, were was um, was art well done? You know, they had their ideas, thought provoking ideas, but it was also well executed. So no, the idea by itself is not good enough. It's got to be more. It's got to be executed. I'm almost done with this list. I promise. All right. Reason number seven, the belief that innovation is good enough. So that's pretty much self-explanatory. It's like, oh, it's it's new. It's edgy. It's a, <laughs> a lot of programs in the academics they would call the, the progressive piece of music cutting edge. And after I graduated university, uh, the university, after I left college, the term went from cutting edge to bleeding edge. I'm not making that up. It's a silly term. I know. I accept that. But uh, but innovation, okay, innovation is good. Yeah, aspire to innovate. But if it doesn't do anything beneficial or if, if, if you're just worried about it being new, uh, you know, in some way, then, okay, that's, again, it's interesting. Like the idea is interesting, but it's not enough. It's not enough. All right, reason number eight, the belief that the past is inferior. To, to any extent, a small extent, a large extent, people with these ideas that there's no such thing as bad art, because, you know, pushing, pushing convention out of the way, breaking the convention, the conventional, that's, that's a, that's a noble endeavor that's worthy because we know better. That's chronocentrism. You know, the chronocentrism is, I think I said that word right, chronocentrism is this philosophy that we have developed. We know better than people in the last decade, in the last generation, in the last couple hundred years, because we're technologically more savvy. We could we could get stuff done a little bit more, you know. Uh, so that's you know I would say the past is frowned upon. What's of the past? Well, a lot of standards of beauty, structural excellence, aesthetic excellence. And so because those things are of the past, well, that has to be looked down on. We, we know better. So that's another belief uh, or that's another reason why bad art exists is if you are opposite to beauty, if you're opposite to what the past holds and what it adheres to, then that alone is good enough. So therefore, the art can't be bad because that's a that's a good sentiment. So. All right. A few more. And this is an important one. Uh, this this came out of the 60s and 70s. I've mentioned it before with different art movements, but there's this belief that art is life. Life is art. Now, art betters life. Art is separate to the mundane. It's separate to the everyday. But a lot of art artists, starting with Alan Caprow, said, no, 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 no. We have to make art in our everyday. But what happened was they didn't, they didn't, put art into the everyday, they made the everyday art. So I use the example, uh, one of my uh, 
performances in graduate school. No joke. I've said this before. Uh, and I'm freezing a lot. I, I apologize. I, I don't know what we're doing. But but before I, uh, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep talking uh, until I get to the chat. Uh, but one of the performances that I had as one of my last performances as a graduate student was, um, you know, seeing a friend of mine take like six or seven or eight watermelons, you know, place it on a table of a uh, construction paper. And he would hack all these watermelons. And part part of the hacking up the watermelons was the art piece itself. But even more, all the watermelon juice and the the rind of the watermelon and and the shell or the the, the peel, whatever it's called, the rind and the skin of the watermelon, the seeds, the juice, the, the splattering, that would be all on the construction paper. And then you would hold up the construction paper and we, the musicians, would interpret, uh, musically interpret that graphic score. Uh, so it was like hacking watermelons became part of the art piece because you were trying to incorporate the everyday into the art. People tried to say, no, art should be of the everyday and everyone should experience art all the time. It's like, well, you didn't, but you didn't put the art into the everyday. You made every day, you, you made the everyday, you made the mundane, the art. And uh, so that was the, uh, uh, that's the eighth or ninth reason. I can't, I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, so the idea that anyone can participate. So if you're not an artist, you could still be an artist. <laughs> and that's why bad art exists. All right, two more reasons. The belief that competence doesn't matter or that competence at least is an elitist notion. So I've said this before, people coming out of the 60s and 70s with these different movements believed incompetence was okay. And if you dare criticize the incompetent art piece and, and if you dare say it's bad, well, you're invalidating that person's self-expression. And that's not a good thing. So because it's not a good thing, you can't criticize it. You can't invalidate it. Therefore, the art can't be bad. That's that's a reason. And finally, uh, this is the last of my bullet points. The belief that you can't, uh, that, you know, why bad art doesn't exist, why people think bad art does not exist, and why I think it does exist, <laughs> is that there's this belief that you cannot invalidate someone's personal expression. That's not true. You totally can invalidate. Well, you don't don't mean to... I wouldn't, I would ne never suggest someone intentionally tear down a person. Like don't, don't strip them of their dignity to try to s express themselves. But th there's got to be a fine line of something that is executed well or something that needs, you know, between that and then something that needs improvement. The thing is constructive criticism is a good thing. Always have constructive criticism, whether it's by your by yourself like if you know if you're like me working on a piece of music and saying ah, that does not work i need to change the structure here or listen you know, have your family uh help you with that or have some friends you know have some feedback criticism that is constructive is good but peop some people can't some people can't take it they're like wait no you're saying my my piece is bad and therefore you're invalidating my expression now i've had professors more than once uh, like over uh, over a handful of times, I've had different professors say, "Your music did not work here. Your music, I, I think I've pe people have said my music is crap." Now it's it's an unkind way of saying it, but I knew it was bad too. I knew I couldn't get away with a lot with some of my professors. Uh, so so I'm not I'm not going to you know you know stand up tall and, and say, "Well, what are you talking about, professor? Like you're invalidating my self expression." Uh, so those were all the things that I thought of uh, today uh, on why, uh, you know, why bad art does exist out there. People don't, people out there don't think it's bad or people out there don't think bad art exists at all for those reasons that I've named. Uh, so that is, those were my bullet points. If you guys have some uh, ideas, just let me know. I will check, uh, let me check real quick. I'm going to stop the video real quick. Just checking <clears throat> one sec. <clears throat> All right, cool. I th wait, I wasn't checking something. I, I was coughing. That's what I was checking. Uh, All right. 
Oh, Wi-Fi looks good. Maybe it's just, again, Sunday afternoons, maybe it's just uh, the time of day where I freeze, so I do apologize. Um, but actually, it looks like I have some Super Chats. Studio Super, welcome. Good to see you. Oh, I have three Super Chats. Let's get those. Thank you, man. Uh, let's see what you say here first, and then I'll get to the rest of the comments. Um, I forgot the, the computer is so far away. Uh, well, not far away. The screen is smaller. Um, if all art, you say, is subjective and therefore all good, then by that logic, no need for art classes for everything someone does is good. Absolutely. Now, I will say, I'm going to add on to what you're saying. Yeah, art is not subjective. I've made this point so many times. You've heard me if you've been with me for a long time. Art is not subjective. Your experience of that art is what is subjective. Art is objective. Objectively good, objectively bad, objective effectively in between. Maybe you need some, you have room for improvement. Um, now people, here's the thing, people, I feel like the sentiment that art is subjective. I feel like you can get away with it with something like visual art, because even, even though your eyes and sight is a sense that we all need, and of course we are very sympathetic toward people who might not have sight or very impaired sight, it's a sense, and it's a sense we shouldn't take for granted, but it's not, in the way of art, in the way of bad art, it is not the same, I promise you this, it's not the same as music that you orally hear, and even more, more tangible than that, material than that, is the sense of taste. Can you imagine having these sentiments, or I would say, can you imagine a culinary artist having these sentiments that nothing is a bad experience, nothing is bad. And then they give you this, like whoever it is, gives you this, this tray of food that is not even not palatable. It has no taste and the texture is off. And maybe people say, well, texture is preference. That That's true. But some people universally, not universally, but you know, some people have a, a, an instinctive, like, antipathy toward something with a weird gelatin texture or a weird taste to it or or worse no taste what if a culinary artist just gave you a plate of food maybe that had presentation of some kind but had no taste you wouldn't know what to do like you you wouldn't want to eat the meal you wouldn't come on i mean unless you had some other incentive to eat the whole meal like someone would say i i'm, I'm going to pay off your car loan if you eat this plate, uh, in, in, you know, to promote my, my restaurant or whatever. Okay. Maybe, maybe if there's the, maybe if the incentive is good enough, but, uh, you know, people with these, these artistic sentiments that there's no bad art out there. It's like, can you say the same for food? <laughs> I don't think you can. And, uh, some people accept bad music. I, I, I accept that. I don't accept bad music. I accept that people accept bad music. Um, but I've heard, I've heard very jarring music. I've heard, I've heard music that could, I'm not even talking about loud rock concerts. I'm, I'm talking about just how something is amplified directly that could affect your health. Um, and people said, oh, that was a great piece of music, that clarinet shrilling and shrieking and amplified with all these speakers for 15 minutes and the guy turning beet red into blue and just, you know, losing air for playing clarinet the way he did. That's amazing. And, and shame on you for plugging your ears, you guys. Uh, there was, I went to a, I think I said this story before, but I went to a concert in Seattle um, where the clarinet player, he was, he had this clarinet amplified, like really amplified. And he did not play Mozart. <laughs> he didn't have to play Mozart. My point is clarinet can sound very beautiful. But he did not make the clarinet sound beautiful. And he did that for like 10, 10 or so minutes straight to the point where my my ears were splitting. Literally, I felt like everything throb in that eardrum, both eardrums. And I, I held my ears. I'm like, OK, I'm a musician and a composer. I have to protect my ears. And um, most of the audience, they were holding their ears. They were they were plugging up their ears. And one old man said, shame on you for plugging up your ears, guys. This was this was a great experience. And I was like, I couldn't do that 24-7. I couldn't, I don't, I would never want to repeat that experience again. 
and people call it, well, that's, that's not bad art. I'm like, it was, it was awful. It was awful. So yeah, art is objective. And that clarinet piece was objectively horrible. Thank you, Studio Super, for your $9.99. Normal isn't regressive. It's stable. Uh, but these contemporary folks find stability boring. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way of putting it. They're, they, they want to make things dangerous and edgy. So they want to introduce madness to give themselves a rush of excitement and danger. Also, so, sorry for coming late. I well, I well, thank you for coming. Appreciate you. Appreciate your uh, super chats too. I hope your own artistic endeavors is doing are doing well. Uh, thank you again for the four ninety nine. My art never would have gotten good without criticism. I, I think it's true for all of us. Um, I still know I need improvement. Criticism can hurt, but consider those growing pains. I think that's a fine way of uh, saying such, uh, saying that because. Um, Criticism hurts, but it's it's a stretch. Now, I'm a teacher, and I always there's always room for improvement with my students, and I try, especially depending on the personality of the student, I try to first say a few things that they're getting right, or at least one thing they're getting right, or one thing I could tell they've worked on, and I want to praise them for their work on a specific technique. But if they need help with a few other things that are lacking. I let them know and I'm not mean about it unless they give me attitude, but I'm not, I'm not a mean teacher. Uh, but, uh, I've only made one person cry, <laughs> but she was giving me such lip. <laughs> that was years ago. Um, but, uh, I, I try to, with all personalities, it doesn't matter the, the age, uh, it doesn't matter if they're uh, a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. Um, it's, I, I, I do want to edify what they are working on appropriately. Sometimes they'll actually be so self-critical themselves. And I say, wait a second, I know you're hearing this and I know you don't like the sound you're making, but this is good because of this. We're just going to work to clean out the sound. Um, I, I have had professors that were a little rough and, and said like, this, this is crap. Like, I, like, <laughs> Not not on the level of them ripping up my music, but it was there was a couple close calls. And I'm like, ah, did you have to say it that way? And I started crying because I, I I always consider myself a teacher's pet. Um, yeah, criticism. I mean, that that's a thing. Is criticism? It's not nice. It never feels nice. And I again, I, I would say if people are very mean spirited about their criticism, there's a spirit behind that criticism that's not right. But maybe they say something like, no, I I could have been better about that. I could have done better about that. I'll do I'll do the next project with that in mind, you know. So there we go. Thank you though for those wonderful super chats. Yes. Um uh, professor was talking about red being the traditional uh it looks kind of orange, but yeah, red, this is red. It's in real life it's red. Um, or maybe you see it red and I see it orange for the, the, um, yeah, for the, the screen there. But yeah, red is the traditional for Palm Sunday. Uh, I read twice now uh, a very long passage in, in Mark from the, uh, oh, what was it? The, the lady, it was, it was perfume that cost like 300 denarii all the way to the, the crucifixion and death of Christ. And it's, it's important. Palm Sunday and Good Friday, they're important. All right. Let me grab some water. Samuel Proctor says, there's always been more bad art than good. It's easier to do bad art than good. Yeah, there's a... Um, and, and I would say some people that composed very good music in Mozart's time never saw the light of day, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, because just of how information traveled uh, or some music that was composed very well was, was just for the more common folk. Whereas Mozart, he composed for the emperor, uh, at least, at least as, as I remember. But at the same time, um, I think, yeah, I, I don't get this whole glorifying incompetent art. Um, there's this in the academics, 
So if you, again, if you guys ever consider, if you ever have a question about art college and the liberal arts education, just just let me know because I'll let you know what they think. Don't don't, don't you worry. If you have a hard time deciding if you wanted to go to art school, uh, like like the, in the university setting, because I'll I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Um, but a, a strong dislike of this barrier in in music, but this is true for all art. Uh, there was a very strong, in the academics, there, there was this very strong dislike of uh, the barrier that is the stage where the performer, the performers would perform for you and you would watch and dare, dare consume and enjoy some beautiful music. They wanted to like blur the boundary or just remove the boundary in, in, entirely where I went to a lot of concerts, especially in Seattle, but also in Milwaukee where the attendees would be part of the performance experience. Now, sometimes it was a little more structured where I would be in the middle of like, you know, three percussion ensembles or, or players. And then you would be in the immersive experience that is the center of the sound. Okay, that's cool. You know, instead of, instead of being out in the auditorium, the audience would be on the stage if it was a big enough stage and then be surrounded by musicians. Now, that's actually a common... That's also a common, uh, not common, but that structurally we've seen that with concert halls and all of that. But but when when the role of the artist is scoffed at, like you're no better than the attendee, you're no better than the concert goer. It's like there is a role as an artist. You're serving the attendee, you're serving the viewer, you're serving the listener, and that's a beautiful vocation. And it, like, if you can make money off of that, that's even better. <laughs> How dare you, art shouldn't make money. Like, now again, you don't have to make money to to make great art. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this, in the academics, like if you go to a university, at least in the United States, uh, there's this strong, strong sentiment saying that the, attendi the, the attendee is, not, I'm not saying as important or equal to the artist. Like, it's like the, the attendee is not inferior. I don't know where they came up with that com, uh, concept, but there's like, no, like the attendee is as important to your music as you are. But what if they're not musicians? Doesn't matter. It's like, what if they don't know music at all? Doesn't matter. It's like, whatever. <laughs> anyway. I can all I can always rant about my my days in college. All right. Bring good morning. Uh, so yeah, the quote. Um, I think it was Gene Wilder was the, whoever said that which defines limits. Uh, and you say limitation breeds creativity. Yes, if you have a lot of limitation, you'd be surprised how creative you can be. It's it's not. A piece of art is not a free for all thing. Like anything goes because usually when you do that, it sounds like crap. I had a lot of students, uh, not students, um, a lot of colleagues, if you will, uh, some, uh, a lot of uh, fellow students in the graduate studies who really gravitated toward the graphic score, basically uh, picture images, um, and symbols along a sheet music or construction paper, whatever the case is. And then the musicians would interpret like, like a swirly image with whatever suited their fancy for like a trombone, for instance, or a set of drums or symbols or whatever. Now it's an interesting idea. The graphic score is an interesting idea. And some people have done very well with it. Like George Crumb with his, Piano piece, Macrocosmos, that's one that I enjoy. Uh, for anyhow, his graphic scores are actually quite nice looking. I would have to listen to him again to, to see if his music holds. But back, in, especially in the 70s, like like symbols on pages for the musician to interpret was a, a nice idea. Uh, but a lot of students took that to mean, okay, let's just write these arbitrary symbols and it's free for all. The musician can do whatever they want. And most of those types of performances were crud. It was just, the, the music was so boring. It's like, like even five minutes felt like 15 minutes because the musical activity was not engaging. It, it just, it was boring.
Um, all right. Sam Proctor says it's pretty much been released that modern artist like a uh, or, or realized that mo modern artists like uh, Jackson Pollock and others were CIA employees. I I know nothing about that. They did it for the Cold War reasons. I mean that that's they probably were a little political. All of all of these sentiments really came out of places like New York. So if you want to check those artists out, um, yeah. No, I mean John Cage, for instance, he had his role with his uh you know eching music like his chance music his random music uh his music involving silence and um interpretation of words like musical interpretation of words especially with his collaborations with um uh Merce Cunningham I mean he had his role and he had his in, you know endeavor but not no one can replicate what he did with something like 4 minutes and 33 seconds where the pianist sits for four minutes and 33 seconds doing nothing. And uh, yeah, if you want more information on that, I'll let you know, but it's kind of funny. Some some funny stuff, but like no one can rec replicate what John Cage did. John Cage is John Cage. No one, no one should aspire to mimic him or emulate him. You know, just no. <laughs> He did what he did. He had his role in music history, and we have to move on. But all music is silence. Now, what I do appreciate about John Cage and his contemporaries is that they really taught me to work with space and silence. So I'm fine with that. Most of my electronic music is music throughout, but I, I do appreciate a lot of moments of pulling back, you know. All right. Uh, Andreas uh, says there are some directors that think they got to think outside the box, quote, outside the box. Yeah. Especially when adopting, uh, adapting beloved stories, <laughs> Matt Reeves, the Batman cough, Amazon rings of power. Yeah. Amazon rings of power is, is, is a good example of anything goes like the stuff they are doing with that show. It's like, it's, it's scoffed at because it's like, you don't, you don't put those kinds of things in, in stories. And so the idea of a traditional story is scoffed at, but, but then we laugh, we laugh back at them. Did I say that right? We laugh at them in return. Okay. So Nathaniel Solisball said, weird, the audio went out on my desktop, but uh, I can hear you on my phone. Hopefully that was your device. Not, I wouldn't wish you bad audio problems, uh, but yeah. All right. Bluetooth, yeah. Um, Akram Musa, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. You say they just miserable people. Yeah. They want to, well, yeah. I, I, I've talked to a, to a number of artists who aren't really happy people. <laughs> so, but the, the artists who do work in good work and are professional at it, even if they're, they don't make money off of it, like they don't do it as a career, they're happy, you know? Uh, let's see. Son or son, son rebel. It's free. I don't know what's free. Uh, let's see. Brian Gil Gilmartin says, uh, too many people treat history as a linear track to today. You're so right about that. Uh, you see it uh, even with video games uh, with regard to game design. Uh, for example, people will act like older games were only designed that way because devs just didn't know better, which is so crazy if that's true. Uh, Electric Underground has talked about this in a few videos. Interesting. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I could read Brian's. Uh, I like how you preface, forgive my language. Uh, the competence is only, quote, elitist to people who stink at their craft and are too stupid to admit it. It's like, I've heard from even popular YouTubers that uh, to think AI is wrong is elitist of you. I was like, 
Well, okay. Well, then art is elitist. I'm sorry. Some people can do art. Some people can't. Now, everyone can partake in art and see it and listen to it and stuff. But some people can some people can make art. Some people can't. And if that's elitism to you, I'm, I'm sorry. I could never be a basketball player. One, I'm female. <laughs> and two, I'm too old to start. That's just the way the ball bounces. Oh, dude, that was cool. I did not do that on purpose. <sighs> Uh, Hotaru Hagan, uh, Haganezuka. I think I'll just call you Hotaru, Hotaru, or Hotaru. I, I don't, I, I try to do the Japanese pronunciation if I can. Um, you say, I think the Ripperverse is bad if you ask me. That is, that, that's another topic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I only read one story and it was a D minus. Oh, uh, Stunning and Brave Negatron is in. Good to see you. My wonderful prof and channel member. You know, channel members, they they, they do get their comments posted up. Only one $1.99 a month. <laughs> if it posts up. Posts up? I can't even talk. Uh, you say, my love, uh, people are terrified of being deemed intolerant. Yes, yes. But tolerance isn't approving of everything or everyone it's respecting the human dignity of those you disapprove of yes i think i i think going off on that is when people are so offended saying well you're saying my art is bad therefore you invalidate me i'm like no no, no. i'm not invalidating you as a person uh and i'm not invalidating your endeavor to create art but if you work with the within these parameters and make it better in this way then you're gonna you're going to fulfill the pinnacle of your potential. <laughs> and I love how I froze right when I, when I said that. Yeah. Wonderful insight from my wonderful prof. Uh, let's continue on down. Thanks for listening to my little lecture. I was, I wanted to be as quick as you know, going through those as possible. Hey, Amy L, good to see you. Uh, Andreas uh, Hernandez says, um, while I did get positive feedback from my school short film, I still got criticism and people told me what didn't work. Yeah, that's, that's important to know. I'll admit it would have really helped if I realized the flaws sooner. I mean, sometimes you're too late to realize it. I mean, I'll look at some tracks that I released back in 2019 I want to redo those tracks. Now, actually, because I've switched machines a few times, I actually have no way of getting back to some of my tracks, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there's one, like, one album I have, the, the, the mastering of a particular track, or maybe it was the mix, I don't know, but it was so squished in volume compared to the other tracks. It's just very, it's not a bad composition, it could have had better instruments, but the volume output was what what got to me. It's like, that doesn't sound like the rest of my tracks on this album. Uh, but it's actually one of the more popular tracks. I'm like, I kind of wish it wasn't. Or I kind of wish my sound was a little bit bigger, you know, compared to the other tracks. Um, one track in particular has a very overbearing bass line. The bass line is interesting. It's supposed to be a melodic bass line, but it's just so... Uh, obtrusive it's like, it's like in your face while everything else is going here like everything else is here and then the bass is like right at your nose again that's one of my more popular tracks I don't know why but um, maybe people like the concept but I as far as quality I mean that was 2019 we're that, we're about five years in actually be five years five years in May when I first released my my music and I got to get more I'm, I've been composing I've, I've been composing a lot so hopefully I get some tracks out this year uh Samuel says that my Vietnam vet grandpa who flew helicopters always told me if you want to be as deaf as me just be constantly around loud noises yeah that's that's unfortunate I knew a guy uh, actually just a, a recent job I had I'm not working there anymore he was a, a Vietnam vet and he never spoke about it, but like I, I have a journal. He he published a journal of his experience and he was an illustrator. He was a war. He was a combat artist. He was a combat illustrator and um, he would go into these 
he would like fly over these rice fields like uh, on a helicopter like like 30 feet above the ground you know because they could you couldn't fly so high or you, you had the danger of getting shot down so it's like <laughs> can't even imagine you know that kind of stuff and he 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 never really talks about his experiences, but there'd be times where I, I was, I would be in work and like, like, like the seat, the, the owner of the company, like other people would kind of look down on him because he was older and he was retired, but he just needed something to do. And it was like, this guy was a, he was an illustrator, a professional illustrator in Vietnam doing all this crazy stuff, writing to his mother during Christmas, missing being an American Chris on, you know, Christmas day. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. Studio super. Uh, you say for the four ninety nine super chat, I would have more respect for folks if they were like, I know this art is bad, but I like it anyways. That's, that's all I ask that studio super. That is all I ask of people is that they say, okay, it's, it's a bad piece of art, but I like it. Just say that you're, you're not a worse person you're not worse off. You're not a, a terrible person for saying that. It's like, okay, I know this is a bad piece of art, but I like it. Just, there's nothing wrong with it. There is nothing morally wrong about saying something like that, but no, no, no. It's gotta be the art isn't bad because I like it. And that's what matters. Amy L says art school. I'm very disappointed with mine. Well, please, uh, however you're comfortable with it, but share Share some experience, like um, what you studied or what your experience was like. People, people do ask me uh, from time to time if going to music school is worth it or going to art school is worth it. And, and there, there's a place, but I'll say this. I've said this before. Art school and the liberal arts education. So music, art, whatever the case is, dance, whatever. Um, you really should only go to the university if you want to be a professor. If you want to be a professor and teach art and try to get a tenured position, yeah, go to a university. But that's basically all. I mean, you actually, to be an art teacher in the public education, you do have to get at least a bachelor's. But besides that, besides being a teacher in the public education system or a professor, you don't need to go to art school. You don't need to go to music school. In fact, uh, I, I'm, I just turned 37 and I still have student debt. I didn't want student debt in my 30s, but I had it. And, uh, you know, I learned some stuff. I, I, I learned that I love electronic music, but I probably could have figured that out like later without school. Oh, one sec. I got a cough. All right. Uh, I feel like I skipped a couple comments. I'll, I'll go through. Uh, Stunning and Brave Megatron says, I'm at the point where I don't think art school would be good for me considering I've been so self-taught your whole life. Yeah, actually a few artists that I follow, uh, a few mus musicians, they were self-taught. Uh, I never took, I never even took art classes during high school. Um, you know, I, I've said this to, I think, Owen Lister used to be here. He's, he, he, he pops in from time to time and he works on illustrations for stories. And I think he asked me if at one point, like a long time ago, if, if going to art school was worth it. Um, or maybe, maybe it wasn't him, but I basically said that if you haven't gone to art school and you're just considering getting a better education about something, I would just go hire a private instructor. Like the person who is the private instructor like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, for instance, I mean, let's say I was, let's say I was 20 years old and I wanted to be a better violinist. And so I should get a violin performance degree. No, no. Like I would rather spend $200 every two weeks for four years with a private instructor, like the cream of the crop private instructors out there. That's how, I'd, that's how I would personally get better on, on violin is the same is true with an artist, like if you want to be a graphic artist, if you want to be an illustrator, go look for people who are private instructors as well as professionals. That is that is the best education I could ever recommend a person is, hey, spend the money you would spend on college and just hire one person to be your 
paragon of skills for like two years and see see what comes out of that. And, and people who are private instructors, I've noticed they they love teaching. Uh, and they're good at teaching, especially if they've taught for a number of years. Um, some Sometimes you won't get good teachers, um, but, but sometimes you will. Uh, let, let's see. And don't feel like you have to, I'll add to that, don't feel like you have to stay with a certain teacher. I've had students, they they had either been with other teachers and then tried me as a teacher and they they preferred that. And some people would actually go to other teachers, you know, not not preferring me, whether it was my schedule or my disposition. So, and I don't take offense. Uh, it's, it's just how things are. So don't feel like you have to be like you, let's say you try out a, an instructor for a month and then thought, yeah, okay, I think, I think I put my money somewhere else. Just be honest with yourself and be honest with them. They'll, they'll understand. Most teachers are very understanding. All right. Megatron says, don't need a fancy college degree because I know the areas I need improving. So all I have to do is spend more time drawing. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the best teacher is time. Like if you invest your time an hour to two hours a day, if you can. I mean, I know that's not practical for some people, but it's just at least every day. I tell my students, man, half an hour every day is really good. I know people have jobs and families, but if it's every day... Even if it's just like 10 minutes a day and it, it, it works. People don't believe me, by the way. I have I have like parents that kind of like look at me like this or like, really, 10 minutes a day? I'm like, I promise you. Because when 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 they don't do 10 minutes a day, they won't do it at all. <laughs> so like, just give me 10 minutes a day. That's all I ask. Because the 10 minutes will start building a... a a cerebral muscle, an intellectual muscle, and then you'll start doing 20 minutes, then half an hour, and then then you'll get used to just doing it every day for an indefinite amount of time. Maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's two hours. So, yeah. Uh, Megatron says, anyone can be an artist. Uh, most people just don't have the discipline to get started. Or I would say this too, not even the interest. Some people just aren't interested in being an artist and that's cool. Like some people are just fine with being an expert connoisseur, like, or, or someone who would give commentary on art or, or something like that, or not even that. Maybe they go into sports. Uh, Samuel Proctor says, uh, people who want to be artists, uh, who want to be artists, but are older have less excuses than people wanting to be an athlete. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, yeah. Depending on your physical ability, you can start art anytime. <laughs> That's the, that's the beautiful thing. You can't, after a certain age, you really can't work to be an opera singer. <laughs> but yeah. There's plenty of uh, precedent of people learning to be great artists at an old age. Yeah. All right, Samuel, see you later. Good to have you. Um, Andrea says, uh, our school is a, a freaking joke at this point. Ah, the chat jumped. I think it jumped down. Oh, okay. I, I was in that. You say, um, art school is a freaking joke at this point. Uh, one of my art teachers said, oh, all art is political. What? <laughs> all art, all art is political. Art can be political, but it's not definitively political. Uh, I wonder what she thinks of Lord of the Rings or Ninja Turtles. That's yeah. That, well, she probably doesn't think it's art. <laughs> I, I think that's my assumption is uh, I, I don't think she would treat that seriously. A lot of, yeah, actually, even my professors at the universities, they didn't treat things like pop music seriously. They didn't, um, well, and, and I'm, I'm even going so far to say is music that is well done. I'd have to, honestly, it's been 15 years since I've talked with them. So maybe, maybe they're different or maybe I misremember them and their positions on things, but they, there was, they, I do remember them giving a wide berth, giving pop music a wide berth. I don't mean pop music like Taylor Swift. I mean popular music, like the literal definition, that which is popular. They, they would, they would not scoff, but they would say 
you know, things that are popular aren't really well done. It's like, that's not true. It could be true, but it's not definitively true. All right. A couple more people. Oh, someone named Bob. Good to see you. Uh, everyone has a different uh, learning process, says Megatron. And once you get to a certain level with your craft, and your work will speak for you in the eyes of your clients. Yeah, in the eyes of clients, public, uh, yeah, all of that. It just, just remember, I mean, most people know this anyway, listening to me. Uh, it just, take, it does take time. I mean, the music that I'm producing now, I, I've had a qu quite, I've had a couple pretty impactful creative breaks in the last couple of years. And I'm very happy. I'm still not at the level I'd like to be, um, but it's getting better and better. And this is after like 10 years after getting my graduate degree, but it was just 10 years of just doing it every day, you know, and you, you don't know what I'm talking about until I release my new music, but you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Megatron says YouTube is my art teacher. It's, it's a good, good platform. I tell my students, you know, if they have questions like to, to look over some, um, music lessons online on YouTube. Andrea says art school is not worth going into debt for. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, even college is not worth, worth going to debt for. Yeah. College has, uh, it, it wasn't like it was in the eighties. It wasn't like, it certainly wasn't like what it was in the forties, you know? All right. So Anyway, uh, on that note, I think that will be good. Uh, so that was fun. I know that was a little bit more academic, if you will. Um, but I, I always have fun talking about this. Um, just a couple things. Well, one thing about my channel is that um, I think my collar's crooked all this time. It has, has been crooked this whole time. I don't know. Ugh. <laughs> oh, whatever. I don't care. It's, it's not bad art. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? So on my channel, I'd like to do more super collider stuff, but uh, I'm at this point where I can't really do any demonstration that is educational uh, with super collider. I just need to actually do a lot more experimentation with super collider. I need to just get back into composing in super collider. And that's, that's, that's going to be a, a long process just to review a lot of stuff that I've been doing over the years. So I can't really guarantee a video, uh, uh, this week. I'll, I'll, I'll try, but I, I'm not going to push myself because I've been getting a lot of composing done. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's about. You know, it's like, okay, I love YouTube. I always want to have a video, uh, for a couple, you know, every, one, one video a week or whatever. Uh, I might put some shorts out, but, um, but composing and writing is ultimately my most important task, uh, creatively speaking. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, thank you, Ghost Planet. Uh, you say before I go, you like you love Night Gallery on TV show. It has some creepy paintings and art. Well, thank you, thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, yeah, Gothic is great. Uh, so anyway, um, that so you know I would always love to put out more videos for my YouTube channel. I think there's a steady growth uh, uh, of people tuning in, which is great. I love that. Uh, Sundays, you know, Sunday streams will always be the case talking about art or pop culture or stories or whatever uh that as far as logic pro and super collider i just i gotta just keep keep composing um so if i have something educational it'll be something like two minutes <laughs> or something so that will that, that'll be the idea in the next uh within the next month or so just really focusing on composing music and writing good stories. So with that, uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And until I see you next, keep producing, preserving, and promoting that great art you love. See ya.